The house sat on a five-acre lot of rolling hills. And in the morning, you could see beams of light shooting through the trees. And you could see the streams of light in the mist that would rise up from the grass as the sun was rising up. And there was this giant bay window. And my mom had this chair sitting in the bay window where she would sit and have, have her cup of coffee and watch the day roll in. It was really quite a beautiful place, but it wasn't quite perfect. There was a tree. It was a pretty big tree, maybe 24 inches at the base. And it was the tree closest to the house, right on the other side of the driveway. And it blocked what would otherwise be this unobstructed view of this field. And that wasn't the only problem. The tree was falling apart. You see, every time a storm would come through or a, a heavy wind would pick up, we would always worry that another limb would fall off the tree and land into the driveway. And so my brother and I were both home from college on, uh, on spring break this time. We were both teenagers at the time. And I, I remember my brother was talking to my mom, lamenting the sad state of this tree. And he finally said to her, much to my surprise, Lee and I will take care of this tree for you. And uh, at the time, you know, we didn't know anything about felling trees and notches and back cuts. We didn't have any tools at all. So we go out and we buy a double-headed axe. And we come home and we start chopping down this tree. Now, a tree of this size takes a long time to chop down with an axe. And so there was plenty of time to ponder this situation. I remember one time I'm looking up at the tree, I'm looking over at the house, and I say, hey, Tom, this tree is tall enough that if it were to fall just right, I reckon it might hit the house. He looks and agrees. I said, well, what are we going to do to keep the tree from falling on the house? He says, you know, we'll get a rope. So we go into the garage, we find this long, old rope, and we throw it around the top of the tree, lasso it as high up as we can. And the plan is, when the tree starts to fall, we'll, we'll pull down on the rope, and that will make the tree fall this way instead of into my mom's bay window. So we continue chopping along, and finally it happens. We hear the sound of that, that crackling sound that happens right before a tree is about to fall. Tom says, now, Lee, pull! And I'm pulling on the rope. We're tug of warring this thing, and we're winning. The tree is bending back towards us. And then, pop, the old rope snapped, and the tree starts to spring back towards the window. There's nothing that could be done. I mean, we're just looking at this huge tree. I look at it, it's falling. It's this terrifyingly slow motion towards the window. And then there was the sound. It was like somebody dropped a dog on a pile of a thousand cats. The screeching of the glass as these branches scraped by the window. And I, and I, I was like, ah. Uh. And then finally, we realized it wasn't quite tall enough to crush the house. It just scraped the window. No damage, <laughs> no damage was done. But it was, it was quite a feeling. So why do I tell you the story about the tree and the house? It's because a lot of times I talk to these store owners that have about as much experience as securing their payments as my brother and I did chopping down this tree. I mean, you know, something has to be done. You've heard SSL, you take matters into your own hands and you hope for the best, rather than, you know, really trying to figure out how to, how to do this properly. Let me see if I can flip this slide here. So, in fact, there's so much misinformation about, about securing payments. In fact, even here at the conference, I've heard people say things that, that, that aren't quite right. And it's just, for instance, one of the big things is PCI compliance is done at an organizational level. It's not, it's not your website that's PCI compliant, it's you as a business. So the bottom line is, if you accept credit card payments, then you have to be PCI compliant, regardless of whether you have an SSL certificate or you use whatever, whatever payment gateway, your organization as a whole has to be PCI compliant. And if you take credit cards through some other means, over the phone, through the mail, whatever, that part is included. Now, most of us, we just have, we just have websites. And so we want to secure that. And so there's four common approaches to figuring out how to pull that off. The problem that everyone wants to avoid 
is a full-blown SAQD. What that means is SAQ stands for self-assessment questionnaire. And when you go and you get a, uh, a merchant account or you set up your payment gateway, one of the things that will be required is you have to fill out this self-assessment questionnaire to assess how much of the payment process you handle on your own. And this is an example of what you don't want to do. You don't want to have your browser, which is rendered by your WordPress site with the payment form on it, you don't want to pass that credit card data into your server and then from the server to the payment gateway. That's the worst. So if you do that, you have to fill out what's called SAQD, and it literally takes like months of full-time effort. It's very invasive. And so people try to think of stuff to overcome the problem of trying to comply at this level. And so the idea is you want to try to pass the, the cardholder data to the payment gateway without it touching your web server. But what is commonly um, stated is that if you don't touch the web server, well, then you don't, you're not, you don't have to worry about PCI compliance. And, and that's just not the case. There's four things that contribute to the scope of PCI compliance. One of them is storing credit card data. And I think pretty much everybody knows you don't store credit card data on your server. I mean, we kind of understand that. The other one is payment processing. And most people don't, don't do that. You, know, so you get a payment gateway in the merchant bank and they handle the processing of the payment. But there's two others. One of them is the collecting and the other one is the transmitting of the cardholder data. So that means the collecting, you, you type the information in on the form. The transmitting is you send it from the form to somewhere else. And so what you want to do is you want to scoot your way down to SAQA. That's the easiest one. It's about one page, it's 13 questions, and you can generally answer it without much trouble. And basically the bottom line to the SAQA is somebody else does it all for me. And so when you begin to fill out the SAQA, it says in particular for e-commerce merchants, all the elements of the payment page delivered to the consumer's browser originate only and directly from a PCI DSS validated third-party service provider. And so what that means is you don't do it yourself. Someone else does it. So that's what you're shooting for. And the way that you accomplish something like that, there's four common ways, and really only two of them matter but I want to show you all four so you can know what to look out for. The direct post, this is where you have a form with an action tag or an, act, an action attribute in the form tag and you post directly from the form to the gateway. You send the credit card information there and your WordPress server is in the background and not in the mix. And so you think, okay, yeah, okay, great. There, uh, you know, my WordPress server is not doing it, anything, but the problem is all of the elements of your payment page are coming from your WordPress server in this, in this example, which doesn't put you in the SAQA, it puts you in the SAQA EP. That is a much larger commitment. That's about 51 pages, it's over 130 questions, and it's stuff about firewalls and keeping the software up to date on your server. I mean, I answer support tickets a lot, and I constantly find people with PHP 5.2 still on their server, which reached its end of life over five years ago. I mean, an another example is that if your server accepts, if you can FTP into your server, it's not gonna pass SAQ AEP, because it's, it's, it's an insecure protocol. So, you have to do, you don't wanna do this, you wanna do something else. So what's next on the list? Well, maybe you could use JavaScript. Well, that has the exact same problem as the direct post method, only instead of directly posting with the form tag, now JavaScript is handling the mix. But the whole idea of all the elements coming from the secure server, that doesn't, that doesn't apply, so you're still in AEP at this point. So behind door number three, <laughs> we, have, we have an iframe. Now, the iframe approach is what you might see with something like uh, Braintree JS or the way the old Stripe JS used to work. And the general idea, actually the, uh, the, old Stripe J the old Stripe JS and Braintree JS were examples of the JavaScript one. An iframe would be the new Stripe JS, which works by you, you apply some JavaScript into the mix and it does its magic and behind the scenes it pulls in the payment attributes of the, the, where the credit card information is, but not the entire page, just that little form where the credit card is, comes from the secure server and then you're kind of directly posting the information into the payment gateway by way of that iframe, and that will put you in the SAQA. 
So under this situation, what you would need to do is you would have to have an SSL certificate on your site. You would have to be using some form of a, of a, of a method, like the new Stripe JS or whatever, that uses an iframe. And that gets you into the lowest level of, uh, of, of this SAQ thing, where you just fill out the one, one form with the 13 questions and say, you know, whoever the payment processor is, they do the thing. My concern with all of that is that it's very easy to, or comparatively speaking, to, to hijack this process. Because in the same way that JavaScript is pulling in the iframe, and in the same way that we saw with that form tag, with the direct post, another snippet of JavaScript could pull in an erroneous frame. So it doesn't have to come from the payment gateway. You could just change the source attribute of the iframe to pull in the bogus frame. And the, ba the really bad part of that is there's no visual indication that this has happened. The, frame, the form still looks the same because you still have the payment forms for the credit card. They're just coming from the bad guys instead of the good guys. You still have your SSL lock. The domain name is still the same. And so this hack can go on for an extended period of time without anyone really being aware of the fact that it's going on because, you know, an erroneous snippet of JavaScript snuck into your site through some other plugin vulnerability, through whatever. It somehow got in there. No PHP code needs to be changed in order to make this happen. It just happens and bad things can happen. But it does get you in the SAQA. So this is one option. A third option, or the, the fourth option rather, is to have a secure hosted payment page. So the difference is now you would go from your checkout page all the way over to a whole brand new page on a different server that's PCI compliant and secure, and that's where you enter in the cardholder information and, and you know, process the payment and then redirect somewhere maybe back to your site after that. An example would be you know, like PayPal, for instance. You have a checkout button, you bop over to the PayPal site, and then after that, you go back to your receipt page maybe on your, your WooCommerce site. And this is the approach that I've always felt like has been the most secure, and w the, the job that I have is we make secure hosted payment pages. We had this product called MyGyra, it's been around f like maybe four, almost five years, and um, the reason we created the product was the hosted payment page paradigm has a couple of inherent drawbacks. One of which is, pretty much all of them have to do with customization. Like when you bop over to the PayPal site, you're obviously not on your site anymore. You're at PayPal site. It looks like PayPal. Maybe you've got your logo, but you don't have your design. And so what we did is we've created this, this way where you can have this secure hosted payment page, but it looks exactly like your WordPress site. You log in, you click this button, and it clones the payment page with your WordPress theme. So everything is seamless. The domain name changes across the top because that's where the security happens. It's on our, our secure server. But the actual page itself is hosted securely, but it looks just like the design of your actual site. And then when you're done, you just, you just bop on back to uh, the, the WooCommerce site for the, uh, for the receipt. So that's the mix about how payment pages work and the four different options. And the two that are the ones that you really want to focus on are either the iframe approach, if you feel comfortable with the security vulnerability that we talked about there. It is going to get you into the SAQA. It's probably not, well, at least if you ask me, probably not the best approach, but it is an approach. And then the secure hosted payment page is the other approach. The two that you want to avoid would be the ones where you're actually hosting and col the, the collecting and the transmitting part. If you're doing that, you're going to have to figure out this thing about the SAQ AEP, and that's going to, you know, that's just going to be a little bit more of a headache. But, and then, of course, the big thing would be to, uh, to not have the data pass through your actual server. And so one last word of warning, a lot of times you'll see advertisements on payment gateway sites where you get where you have like the browser on one side, you have like your server in the middle, then on the right hand side you've got, you know, the magic that goes on in the gateway and then you've got this big arrow that goes over the top and they say, "Oh, there you go. Just do that and you're fine." Well, you're not fine and those are the reasons why. So if you have any questions about all of that, you, know, you certainly can field them at the, uh, at the end or whatever, but I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you.